we're going to now look at the reactivity of the carbon alpha to a carbonyl. This carbon is reactive because an enol can form and then that alkene type bond, the pi bond there, is able to do uh, uh, electrophilic addition. And that carbon is relatively acidic. Here's an example of uh, how these reactivities can occur. The enol can form, uh, as shown right here, through tautomerization, and then the pi bond reacts with an electrophile. If we treat a carbonyl with a base, we form the enolate. That's right here. The enolate then, then can attack the carbonyl. So we have two modes of reactivity of that alpha carbon. Alpha substitution can occur through this uh, acidic carbon. Methane has a very high pKa because it is not acidic at all. And this, uh, and acetone right here, let's see, there we go, right here is acetone, and its pKa is 19.3, so it's much more acidic due to stabilization of the negative charge on the carbon adjacent to that carbon nail. It, it, we have a uh, resonance occurs that stabilizes that negative charge. Um, notice this pKa is still high, and it's still a weaker acid than alcohols, so something like uh, sodium methoxide will not deprotonate this completely. But with a much stronger base, like lithium diisopropyl amide, which we call LDA, it has a pKa of 36, and so it will deprotonate something like this. We'll look at that further. The type of carbonyl that you have uh, adjacent to that alpha carbon is important. Aldehydes and ketones have a more acidic proton than acid derivatives. Their pKa is in the range of 16 to 19. Something like nitriles and esters, those all have a pKa range of about 25. And so you need a stronger base with them than you do with aldehydes and ketones. The number of carbonyls on that alpha carbon is important too. If you have, one, let's say, uh, cyclohexanone, its pKa is in the 16 to 19 range. But if you have two carbonyls between that one carbon that is a, 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 that's alpha to both carbonyls, it makes it much more acidic. And then something like sodium ethoxide is a uh, plenty strong enough base to deprotonate it. So we're going to see this now. The pKa of acetone is 19.3, acetonitrile is 25, ethyl acetate, it's the pKa of this proton, is 25. Well, this is acetaldehyde, and it's slightly more acidic than acetone. Now look at this double carbonyl compound. The, this carbon that's alpha to both of these carbonyls has a pKa of 9, much lower. Complete deprotonation uh, occurs if, with the thoxide if you have two carbonyls. Otherwise, this is not going to be a strong enough base for an aldehyde or ketone. If you ha want to deprotonate an aldehyde or ketone, you have to use something like sodium hydride or lithium diisopropyl amid, uh, amide. Uh, we like using lithium diisopropyl amide because it is non-nucleophilic. There's no competing reactions. Sodium hydride is a good strong base, and it, it works very well too. But don't use sodium ethoxide or sodium hydroxide for a ketone or aldehyde because what happens is you have a tiny amount of the enolate form, but it's not complete. And what we're going to see in future chapters is when you have a tiny amount of the enolate form and it's not complete, you have some competing reactions that can occur. This is lithium diisopropyl amide, which we abbreviate LDA, and it is diisopropylamine, which has been deprotonated uh, with uh, uh, an alkyl lithium compound to give us lithium diisopropyl amide. It's hindered 
and so is non-nucleophilic. Here's an example. Here is cyclohexanone. If we use LDA, it completely deprotonates it. The um, side product that we get is uh, diisopropylamine, which is easy to remove from a reaction mixture when you're, few, uh, you're finished using the enolate. So which is the most acidic proton on each of these compounds? Well, let's look at this first one. You have two alpha carbons. So there's two protons here and one here. Where, which is the most acidic one? This one is most acidic because the negative charge can be additionally stabilized by the pi system in the benzene ring. So that is the carbon that would be deprotonated if you treated this with base. What about this cyclohexane carbaldehyde? Well, there's a hydrogen on this alpha carbon, and then you see this hydrogen too. Which one's most acidic? Never ever remove this one. That is not acidic at all. You remove that, and you would put a negative charge on this carbon that uh, has is it, it would there is be no stabilization of that uh, anion there. So um, do not ever remove this proton with base. The proton that would be removed is the one on this alpha carbon, and uh, that's the most acidic proton on that co compound. Let's look at this compound. Which one is most acidic? Well, we have three protons here, and we have one proton here, and it has nothing to do with the numbers of protons, which one is more acidic. It has to do with stabilization of the anion. If I form an enolate here, I've got electron donating groups on it. If I form an enolate here, it's primary and it's more stable. So this is the more, uh, you find the more acidic proton on this carbon. Look at this compound and determine which is the most acidic proton. Well, carbons that are alpha to a ketone have more acidic protons than carbons that are alpha to an ester. But if I look at the carbon alpha to the ketone, there's no protons here. So you can't remove any protons from these alpha carbons. So the most acidic proton we have is right here. What about this compound? Well, if I look at this compound, you'll see that we have a carbon here that is alpha to the carbonyl. And not only that, there's a pi system here that could help stabilize that negative charge. But you're forgetting that is a very acidic group. What is going to be removed by base? that proton. So be careful when you're looking at your compounds. Try to find the most acidic proton and use your head. So now with these reactions here, I want you to tell me which way will equilibrium shift. In other words, is the base that's mixed with the carbonyl compound strong enough to completely deprotonate that uh, alpha carbon. Well, let's look at this first one. We've got sodium ethoxide and a ketone. Sodium ethoxide is not a strong enough base to completely deprotonate this, so this side of the equilibrium is favored. Here I've got lithium diisopropyl amide with the same ketone. What is going to happen? This side will be favored because this is a strong enough base to completely deprotonate ketones. Let's look down here. If I look, I've got a two carbonyl compound, so it's going to be very acidic. Sodium ethoxide is a strong enough base to completely, whoops, oh yeah, to completely uh, deprotonate that compound, and this side of the equilibrium would be favored. Okay, alpha substitution uh, is when you can put something in place of the hydrogen alpha to the carbon. 
Uh, the first thing that we're going to look at is how the tautomerization of the enol form can easily add. Uh, we form the enol from the keto form, and we've done this before. You know the mechanism. Notice it's always going to be uh, more rapid by acid or base. So if you're in pure water, you have a very slow reaction. But if you have water with a little bit of hydrochloric acid, then you're going to have a very rapid equilibrium between the keto form and the enol form occurring. Likewise, if you have water with a little bit of base added, it doesn't have to be much. Catalytic amounts of either acid or base will cause this equilibrium to be established rapidly. How is it that acid does it? You protonate the carbonyl and then blah, blah, blah. With uh, sodium hydroxide, what happens? First, you deprotonate the alpha carbon, and then you have proton transfer. Alpha positions are ra a reactive because you can easily halogenate the ene formed in the enol. You can easily add an electrophile to the alpha carbon because the alpha carbon is nucleophilic. So let's look at halogenation first. This can form an enol. Once the enol forms, that enol can act uh, as a nucleophile and do electrophilic addition of chlorine across this bond. And then uh, a proton is removed from the oxygen that has been protonated by the hydrochloric acid. Let's look at the mechanism so you can understand this further. The hydrochloric acid protonates the carbonyl. The carbonyl then forms the enol right here. Oops, I went too far. I'm sorry. The enol right here. And it is formation of the enol that is the rate limiting step. Once the enol forms, there is rapid addition of the chlorine across the double bond. As soon as the, chlor the, double, uh, the pi bond attacks the chlorine, deprotonation occurs on the oxygen. So here's an example. Here we have acetophenone. We treat it with bromine and acetic acid. It's just a catalytic amount of acid. And what happens? We get bromination of that alpha carbon. We can make a conjugated carbonyl relatively easy, uh, easily from any uh, acetone, uh, excuse me, aldehyde or ketone by doing acidic bromination or acidic chlorination and then treating with base and heating. And this is a mild base. It doesn't even have to be a strong base. And you can see then we have an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl here. So what would be the outcome of these two reactions? Well, right here, this is conditions for alpha bromination. So what will we get? We'll just get a bromine right here in the alpha position. What about here? Well, because this is the only way the enol can form in this direction, we get bromination on this carbon. So now you try to figure out how can you take cyclopentanone and make cyclopentenone? Well, since we were looking at alpha bromination, it makes sense that you would form the alpha brominated intermediate, and then you would do uh, de um, remove hydrobromic acid from it, treat it with base, and do elimination. So what are the conditions to go from cyclopentanone to uh, two bromo cyclopentanone? Just bromine and acid. How is it we take the brominated carbonyl and convert it to the alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl, just treat with base.